I, Ashvi Shah, welcome you all for a national online webinar series on mediation hosted by Sayaji Rao Center for Alternate Dispute Resolution, conducted by Faculty of Law, the Maharaja Sayaji Rao University of Baroda, in collaboration with Mediators India. Today, we are having our fourth session on our mediation series, an alternative for resolving a dispute through, through the court-like system is mediation. The judiciary has encouraged parties to use mediation in various aspects like family dispute, construction dispute, dispute between the shareholders and companies and such civil matters. We are obliged to have with us our distinguished speaker, Honorable Dr. Justice Vinit Kothari, former acting Chief Justice, Gujarat High Court, who will enlighten us with his knowledge and experiences on the topic courtroom observation on mediation and Dr. Gitanjali Prabhu Shetty, advocate and mediator who is going to discuss us, uh, discuss with us on the topic importance on unsettled model law and Singapore convention. I welcome you, sir and madam, on behalf of Faculty of Law, the Maharaja Sayajira University of Karada. We also do have with us Ms. Kavita Balakrishna, Advocate, Mediator, Secretary, Mediators India. Welcome to you too, Madam. Before starting with our today's session, I would request all the participants to follow the webinar et etiquettes for a smooth session. Please keep your mics muted and cameras off during the whole session. Do not use the, the share screen option. In case of any questions related to the session, Kindly mail us on scadr-law at msubaroda.ac.in so that we can put up the same before our speakers during our question and answer session. Now, uh, I request Ms. Jankana Jani to play the university song. Oh, 
Now I request Mr. Rajkumar Gupta, Assistant Professor, Faculty of Law, to introduce our Dean, OSD, Professor Dr. Uma Ayer Madam. Over to you, sir. Good morning, our distinguished speakers, our participants, and my dear colleagues. I am grateful for the opportunity to introduce Professor Dr. Uma Ayer Madam. Professor Uma Ayer uh, Madam has over three decades of academic and administrative experiences. Currently, Madam is an officer of a special duty of FOL and director of management development center, the MSU. She has uh, served as a former dean of faculty of family and community sciences and has been a member of senate and syndicate of Maharaj Sayajira University of Baroda. Madam specializes in the area of the food and nutrition and her research is related to dietary management of non-communicable diseases like diabetes, heart diseases and as well as adolescent nutrition with a special focus on a midday meal scheme. Due to the exemplary work, Madam has been invited to review a midday meal scheme of a different states of India by the Ministry of Human Resources Development. She has also been to the board of eminent bodies of different universities as well as the communities of the government of India uh, and the government of Gujarat. Madam contribution in her field is illustrated through her publication. Madam has been authored two books and published over a hundred of research articles research papers and articles in various national and international journals. Madam has been the principal investigator of a various minor and a major project uh, projects funded by the government, NGOs and industries. She has led a project for a Britannia Industries Limited, ICMR, JRF, uh, UGC, Kellogg's India Limited, WHO, ICMR, uh, Petronet, uh, LNG Limited and many more other uh, other projects. Madam has also con uh, contributed to the development of e-contents on a various uh, topics of e-part sala. Madam noteworthy contribution to academics has resulted in her being a recipient of many national and international awards from an eminent institution and organization like uh, Indian Dietric. Association, Sardar Patel University, Home Sciences Association of India, and uh, Aims of New Delhi, and many other organizations. Uh, through her guidance and encouragement, the FOL has been ranked the first in the state of Gujarat and third in the uh, top outstanding law school of excellence of CSR GHRDC Law School Survey 2021. It is my privilege to invite Professor Uma Ayer, Madam, to deliver a welcome address. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Rajkumar, for that elaborate uh, bio data. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, respected Honorable Vice Chancellor of the Maharaja Sayaji Rao University of Baroda, Professor Vijay Kumar Srivastava, our keynote speaker for today's session. Honorable Dr. Justice Vinit Kothari, retired Judge High Court of Rajasthan, and Dr. Gitanjali Prabhu Shetty, advocate and mediator from the Mediators India. Our coordinators for the mediation series webinar, Dr. Namrata Lohar and Kavita Balakrishnan from uh, Mediators India, and uh, our coordinator, Ms. Kavita Bhatia, along with all the colleagues of the Faculty of Law, dear students and participants. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the fourth day of the mediations, uh, national uh, webinar series on mediation, which is jointly organized by the Sayaji Rao Center for Alternate Dispute Resolution of the Faculty of Law of the Maharaja Sayaji Rao University and the Mediators India. In all, we had planned five sessions and today is the fourth uh, session, which uh, will be dealt by the two experienced uh, keynote speakers. And uh, we hope that uh, 
uh, with today's session we will uh, they will provide us with valuable inputs and skills and it will help us to strengthen our mediation center at the faculty of law looking forward to listening to you uh, both of you and uh, uh, some great learnings and inputs for our center too thank you and welcome you once again thank you so much uma ma'am now i request dr namrata luhar assistant professor faculty of law to talk about the mediation webinar series a very good morning respected professor dr vijay kumar shrivastav honorable vice chancellor the maharaja sahaji rao university of baroda and the patron of the national webinar series on mediation professor uma ayer webinar director and osd faculty of law honorable dr justice vinit kothari former acting chief justice gujarat high court and ms gitanjali prabhu advocate and mediator our distinguished speakers of the day convener ms kavita balakrishnan coordinator ms kavita bhatia my colleagues from the faculty of law participants and students it is indeed a very proud moment for me rather it is a pleasure for me to talk about the yeah. national webinar series on mediation which is organized jointly by the sahaj rao center for alternate dispute resolution and mediators india the first session was held on 12th of february 2022 and on the first day we had honorable mr justice r m chaya the judge of the supreme court of india and uh, ms uh, pooja anand advocate and mediator who spoke on various aspects of mediation the basic objective of this mediation series is to acquaint the participants about the ins and outs of the mediation the legal aspects involved in mediation and explore the avenues of mediation all the sessions till date have been very interesting and i am very sure the rest of the sessions are also going to be very interesting each of the sessions have given a lot of opportunities lot of inputs on mediation to the students as well as the attendees mediation today is seen as one of the best options for resolution of disputes and everywhere mediation is promoted with that objective in mind to promote mediation and the culture of mediation in the minds of the students this entire webinar series is been planned today we have with us two very distinguished speakers on mediation who will be speaking on various facets of mediation one more session to go after today and definitely i'm sure that these all sessions taken together will provide us inputs on how we can develop our center at the faculty of law as well as what all things can be provided to our students with respect to the opportunities in the field of alternate dispute resolution till date the participants have given excellent feedback of all the sessions organized till date and so i am very sure that for the rest of the sessions also the students and the participants will be extremely benefited the report of the entire webinar series will be prepared and shared with all the concerned people with these words i am thankful to everyone for giving me this opportunity to speak about the national webinar series on mediation i am looking forward for more cooperation and more participation from everyone to boost the activities of sahaj rao center for alternate dispute resolution and looking forward for many more association with mediators india thank you very much thank you so much namrata ma'am now i request dr gansham solanki associate professor the faculty of law to give introduction to our esteemed speaker honorable dr justice vinit kothari sir Thank you, Ashwin, Madam. Uh, good morning to one and all. Uh, respected uh, Professor Dr. Vijay Kumar Shivastava, Sir, uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, the Maharaja Sahaj Rao University of Baroda, Professor Uma Ayer, Madam, Dean OST, Faculty of Law, the Maharaja Sahaj Rao University of Baroda, my colleagues at the Faculty of Law and dear participants. It's a matter of great honor and privilege for me to introduce to you all a very distinguished personality and luminary in the field of law. His Lordship Honorable Dr. Justice Vinith Kothari Sir, former Acting Chief Justice of Gujarat High Court. Respected Sir, please accept my sincere namaste and I welcome you on behalf of Faculty of Law, the great Maharaja Sahaj Rao University of Baroda. 
I could not resist myself but to start with uh, his lordship's educational qualification which is truly inspiring and motivating for all of us. His lordship has done uh, bcom llb and llm. His lordship has also cleared charter accountancy and the company secretary's exam. And this is not all. His lordship is also awarded with doctorate degree in tax law in the year 2004. after having practiced as a charter accountant for two and a half years his lordship got enrolled at bar council of rajasthan as a lawyer and practiced predominantly in the areas of taxation law commercial laws and several constitutional matters before rajasthan high court and supreme court of india his lordship got appointed as a judge of rajasthan high court in the year 2005 during his whole tenure as a judge his lordship has served as a high court judge at karnataka high court madras high court and gujarat high court wherein his lordship was also appointed as an acting chief justice of madras high court for about 2 months and was appointed as an acting chief justice of gujarat high court for one week till retirement during his tenure as a judge his lordship has decided more than 50000 cases that included contested tax appeals writ and writ appeals his lordship has a wide experience not only as an advocate and judge but also as a good administrator and an academician as well his lordship have contributed several papers at national conferences and international conferences on international taxation and allied subjects in various countries such as amsterdam switzerland and australia sir is also an honorary director on the board of international association of tax judges and a member of cmja london his lordship has served as an executive chairman of tamil nadu state legal service authority and has also served as executive chairman of gujarat state legal service authority his lordship has also served as a chairman of the tamil nadu mediation and conciliation center his lordship has also served as a chairman of the gujarat arbitration center and mediation center apart from serving as a chairperson of several important administrative bodies his lordship is also an academician his lordship has served as a teacher at the faculty of law university of jodhpur for about 6 years his lordship has contributed in the field of research by writing several articles in national and international law journals such as an article on constitutional features and indian democracy which was published in the year 2013 by korea legal research institute in their global issues sir has also written an article on child education and poverty alleviation and has given valuable suggestion for compulsory military training to youth of the country which was greatly acknowledged and appreciated by the then president of india dr a p j abdul kalam in the 2006 his lordship served as a chief editor of sales tax literature which is a national level journal his lordship was also the author of ctr early digest and stc early digest from 1979 till 1990 his lordship has completed 40 hours mediation training approved by mcpc taken as a sitting judge of madras high court and decided several cases amicably between the disputed parties through mediation process as a sitting judge during his tenure as a judge his lordship has decided several leading cases some of them include winding up order of two companies of vijay malia group king fisher airlines and united breweries group in karnataka high court in admiralty jurisdiction leave of a company court not required while trying original suits in madras high court in admiralty jurisdiction and the said view was followed by the mumbai high court in the matter pertaining to urban land selling laws almost all controversial points were decided by the division bench of gujarat high court 
true hearing by video conferencing in covid 19 period and large number of lpas were decided this is not all his lordship is also a sports person and he loves to play cricket badminton and table tennis he has a wide interest in soft music as well both vocal and instrumental his lordship also plays various musical instruments such as keyboard flute and harmonica your lordship we are truly blessed to have you at this national webinar series on mediation organized by faculty of law the great maharaja sajra university of baroda in collaboration with mediators india it was indeed a great honor for me to introduce your lordships thank you thank you once again for accepting our request once again on behalf of faculty of law the maharaja sajra university i welcome you sir thank you over to you ash madam thank you uh, with the permission of the chair uh, i may i be permitted to add few lines about our lordship uh, uh, after such a lengthy introduction sure ma'am sure ma'am <laughs> sure yeah uh, uh, indeed okay. we are uh, blessed to have such a wonderful uh, justice in our uh, in our mm. state when he was the uh, executive uh, he was the chairman of the tamil nadu mediation conciliation there are many acclaims that he had accomplished by himself it was india's first online mediation was con uh, was conducted for the mediators through his leadership and the first set of judges high court judges being trained as mediators was through his initiative and as a good gesture he joined the training by with uh, along with other brother judges that was commendable thing that uh, it is it was really very appreciated in the uh, among the bar and and the bench and it was never a problem for anybody to just walk into his lordship's uh, uh, office and ask him like this is what i have a problem could you help me out he will definitely do he would take any step possible to dev for the development of mediation that was a wonderful opportunity which we had and we are really thankful for that your lordship and and i really welcome you for this wonderful national thank webinar you, thank, thank you, you your lordship kavita uh, we need to uh, dedicate a book to his lordship i think oh. <laughs> <laughs> as a source I, of inspiration i feel i feel humbled and uh, agreed i was wondering whether such a lengthy introduction was really <laughs> necessary thank you very much kavita ji lordship that is not for yeah. you that is that is for all the people present here the students yes. who will come and take a cue from your life okay. as they say footprints on the sands of time you know yeah. so to much, thank you so much thank you so much i'm so happy and feel very very uh, i would say elated <laughs> uh, Anyway, but just in a lighter way, I may say, since there is, a, it is usually said, behind every successful man there is a woman. Since my wife is also a trained mediator, she pushed me to all this, and <laughs> and no, this is the subject which I have loved from the beginning. And uh, uh, can I can I start my address to you? Of course, you are. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor, rather, I would say. to be invited in such a prestigious university the introduction uh, video which was displayed on the screen showed the great culture of gujarat and baroda especially and maharaja sayaji which we could see in uh, glimpses kind of thing is wonderful university it appears and i would love to visit some day physically also baroda whenever i think now the covid relaxations are there and we can always assemble also and uh, thank you so much for inviting me on the session for mediation because the, as kavita ji rightly said that uh, this is the subject which uh, i have always felt that is a very important part of justice dispensation adr which you have this sayaji adr excellent or excellence and it is wonderful to for the core system entirely as such to uh, to offload their burden because we all know indian courts are so much overburdened with the workload and to uh, push the workload to the adr system like arbitration and mediation other judicial settlement section 89 gives you five modes uh, it's a it's a great thing which indian legal system has created for the disputants and litigants and i'll be talking about this mediation thing today mainly because uh, 
i am very happy first of all that young students in their law graduation are now under the guidelines of bar council of india are necessarily going through the course also of mediation i will tell you friends uh, that uh, though india is yet to have a formal mediation act which is now in the form of a bill before the parliament and uh, it is in pursuance of the supreme court judgment rendered in march 2019 by just sikri uh, in krishnan krishnan's case that uh, the parliament should enact a law because section 89 was not somehow felt sufficient for this purpose it did not give the guidelines and uh, it thanks to the justice ravindran who gave the detailed judgment in afcon's case in 2010 which laid down all the guidelines uh, for mediation what uh, issues what disputes can be referred to mediation what cannot be referred because we should know both sides of the coin and then how the mediation process should be undertaken a training for the mediators is necessary a committee mcpc mediation committee uh, was created by the on the supreme court of india and then they started this 40 hours uh, course for all the persons uh, advocates with minimum 15 years of experience and judges at all levels and then uh, they had to undergo this training and i may tell you i may share this as a sitting judge of madras i could when along with my 26 uh, sitting colleague judges took this training after the week end two weekends three days we spent on both the weekends uh, remaining were working days then we felt that if not anything else we are now better judges because mediation training uh, taught us so much to how to become a patient listener above all which even otherwise a judge is supposed to have but then how to understand the problem how to go behind what is appearing on the paper on the file before you and then understand the real interest of the parties real concern of the parties real root of the dispute of the parties that can be done only in mediation process not in court process not in the pleadings not in the arguments of lawyers and that is why this system of mediation where we say that both parties after a successful mediation are in a win win situation both parties feel that yes we have come out of a rigmarole of the uh, court system which unfortunately in our country is more uh, like a cobweb of procedures and length of time and costly affair and this and that so in mediation process somebody really feels happy after one gets the success or a settlement out of the mediation process which a trained mediator helps you he is only a facilitator a trained mediator on the board in the mediation room is only a facilitator and therefore he has no he, he can neither dictate mediation process is not even compulsory and is entirely voluntary process so all these uh, uh, area of uh, different aspects of mediation required a codified law and in persons of the supreme court decision now the parliament has taken up the bill the bill is under debate various organizations various institutions various mediation centers are now discussing the draft of the mediation bills and uh, hopefully very soon we will have a very good codified law which will match with the international uh, standards and international aspects of the matter because you should also know that mediation is not only a indian subject or uh, restricted to india there are subjects including international taxation and commercial disputes which uh, go beyond the boundaries of the country and therefore mediation in even taxation field which is i can say it was my field in the sense that i practiced tax and as a judge also practiced mostly in the uh, tax side is a is a uh, concept whose day has come now so mediation is a subject which uh, is very very necessary now for all young law graduates to understand properly fully and above all i feel that not only or not only the practice in the courts or joining as a, a lawyer in the law firms is now the area even the mediation itself per se is a great area to practice law uh, for the young lawyers because there is no uh, age uh, as a counsel when you enter the field if you can persuade your uh, clients or litigant parties to go for mediation as an alternative dispute resolution mechanism then is a great service to the society and to the judiciary as such because knowing that uh, judiciary is overburdened if we can offload our court system with a great uh, load of work 
by uh, requesting the parties, explaining to them and, and educating them to go for ADR like mediation. Uh, then it's a great, I believe, a service. And even as a profession, I would say that uh, young and even old lawyers can go for it uh, in a very big way. My little experience in this field shows that as of now, uh, though the efforts are made by all the court systems or all the judges, senior judges who are uh, heading these institutions in different high courts, 25 high courts, uh, still the reference of the cases, pending cases to the mediation or India is less than what it should be. And for that, I would urge the lawyer friends and even young lawyers, you, know, you graduate people who, when you go to the practice field, to adopt this as a part of a profession very, very seriously. And I hope with the new codified law in place and rules made there under, you will have good earning uh, avenues also in the mediation field. There is nothing to worry because this is the general uh, feeling in the profession which used to be there, I would say, that if the dispute is settled quickly, the lawyer's fees is curtailed or they will earn less. This is a absolutely misconception, I would say. And a satisfied client with a proper settlement with a dispute and peace, dispute put to an end and peace acquired will be a more uh, valuable client for you and it will bring you, bring you 10 clients if he goes out of the system satisfied and happy. And therefore young professionals should uh, definitely understand this and uh, work for this, I would request them to do so. Now let me talk something about the mediation as a ADR process, why it was uh, considered necessary and why it evolved like this. Now, as you know, section 89 of the Civil Procedure Code, which I, I think most of you must have already read, but just for your uh, 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 information. And as a lawyer and judge, also I've always felt that whenever you talk about something, statutory provisions, you should always read the provision afresh. Maybe uh, every day, if you have to work upon that, read the provision every day. So not only you get a better understanding of the provision, but a better insight into the scheme of the things of that provision also. Therefore, it's very necessary to read section 89 and I'll just briefly read it. This is in part 5 of Civil Procedure Code 1908 and it came in 1999. Earlier section was relating to arbitration, with which we are not much concerned now, old times. Now we are having new mediation law, as I said, that provide a uh, settlement of disputes outside the code. The heading of this section 89 is arbitration, but it provides for more modes. Where it appears to the code that there exist elements of settlement. Now mark these words. Where it appears to the code that there exists elements of a settlement which may be acceptable to the parties the court shall formulate the terms of settlement and give them to the parties for their observations. And after receiving the observations of the parties, the court may reformulate the terms of possible settlement and refer the same for clause A, arbitration, clause B, conciliation, clause C, judicial settlement, including settlement to local dollar, clause B, mediation. Now, though these are four or five items are mentioned, uh, local dollar is also there. Uh, why arbitration and uh, mediation have become more popular? The obvious reason is that in remaining modes of ADR, the court's involvement did not go out. And therefore, in arbitration, you have independent arbiter to choose as per your arbitration agreement or clause in the agreement. You can name your arbitrator or you can refer it to the institution who can nominate a competent arbitrator for you or for mediation where the mediation institutions or mediation centers annex with the courts can nominate a trained mediator for you. You get an independent kind of person to understand your dispute, to understand your controversy, to understand your interest, and then guide you for a proper, agreed, mutually consented settlement. Now, talking about mediation, friends, mediation is nothing but a experienced person, a trained mediator who facilitates your own settlement process. The parties are neither compelled to go for mediation, nor it is compulsory for them to remain in the mediation process for all times to come when if the court has referred them to mediation. 
they can at any point of time walk out of that also. And they can say, no, we are not interested in settlement, let the court decide. Mediator cannot force, nor any mediation center can force. No, no, you have to go for mediation or you have to agree to the certain terms of settlement. It's absolutely a voluntary process. So it is by choice of the parties that the mediation is taken as a judicial process. The sanctity of settlement or sanctity of the mediation process is there. Once is, if the mediation fails, then there is nothing much to be done. The mediator can just send a report to the center and center can in turn forward that report to the court that, sir, the mediation has failed. We are sorry. The parties want the court to decide the controls. Very well, the court will take up that. But if the mediator can facilitate, the parties can come to terms, a settlement of the dispute, the terms of the settlement are reduced to writing, that is called settlement, and with the signature of the parties concerned, they may be companies, corporates, individuals, or whatever, or trusts, the mediator countersigns that, that yes, this has happened in my presence, and these are the terms of settlement. That settlement terms or settlement deed or document is sent back to the court where from the case came to this ADR system and court has to just then see that the terms of settlement are not illegal or not against public policy. It does not result in a unenforceable contract. <coughs> if that is so, then most of the contracts or most of the settlements are implementable and executable. And that becomes the decree of a court. Now, decree of a court, as you know, <coughs> is enforceable. Just a moment, please. So, in mediation process, the court time is saved because otherwise the court would have to listen to both the sides, their lawyers' arguments, and then apply the law, find out the case laws, or write the case laws, nurse the case laws, and then give a decision. And that doesn't become final. That goes up to further appeals, first appeal, second appeal, and up to Supreme Court, it can go sometimes. But in mediation, if a settlement has been arrived at, that becomes a decree binding on both the parties, and there is no further appeal. A settlement cannot be tinkered with or disturbed or set aside unless the consent of the party, any other party or one party has been obtained by a fraud. Some fraud has been played. Then, as you know, fraud vitiates everything and therefore even the settlement can go. Now, there is very, very exceptional circumstances. Since it is all happening by the consent of the parties in their presence, they are the persons who are evolving their settlement. They talk to each other. The mediators allow them to talk to each other. Mediators then talk to one of the parties in confidence, make the summary of that and make it known to the other side, put it to the other side in confidence, take his or her feedback, and then a joint session can be had. This all process is uh, given by way of training to all of us when we undergo this 40 years training. Now, if that is the procedure where the party's full confidence is there between each other and in the mediator, that he will not mislead or make any misrepresentation or will not divulge anything to the other side, which should not be divulged if something has been said to the mediator in confidence with a promise that you will not disclose it to the other side. He or she is not supposed to disclose it to the other side. Now, this confidentiality is another feature of the mediation, which is very, very important. Because if the parties do not have the faith and confidence in the mediation system or mediator as such, then no mediation can succeed. Therefore, it is very, very necessary that the mediator has to be not only a good experienced person, he should understand the human psychology also very well. Generally, I say in my addresses also at various places that a lawyer is not a, only a person who knows the law. A good lawyer is a complete package of a good personality. You should be a good human being. You should, of course, know the law. You should also know the psychology, sociology, society, traditions, culture, history, geography, everything. 
then you can perhaps guide the persons in the set of circumstances which they are in and they come to you for settlement of the dispute now mediator does not give you anything settlement like a magic wand he only guides you that if you give this proposal or if you accept this proposal it will be not only legally valid but it will be perhaps good to go through it will give you peace for example section 138 cases of negotiable instrument act check this one now suppose somebody owes a sum of rupees 1 lakh and gives a check the check bounces he files a criminal complaint if that matter is referred to the mediation the parties can sit on the mediation table say all right some waiver of interest some installments of the principal amount give me some period my period has been lean in the past weeks or months or years so if this kind of adjustments can be made between the parties that dispute can very easily be settled and this is generally happening you might be knowing that 138 litigation is the greatest additional burden on the court system after the amendment of converting the civil dispute into a criminal offense by amending section 138 of the negotiable instrument act now if that is so take for example matrimonial disputes family partition disputes property disputes boundary disputes agricultural land division disputes generally it is between the family members generally it is between the brothers and sisters parents husband wife children etc etc now most of the problems our experience in the system for last 40 years shows that it is more out of anger and ego rather than a real property dispute which cannot be sorted out matrimonial dispute which cannot be sorted out all these disputes can be given the peace by the good counseling by a mediator in the mediation system now that is what the good role of mediator is he should not only give a patient hearing to the parties ask them or give them the uh, avenues to burst out their uh, all emotions most of the problems get reduced to 50% if the parties is allowed to burst out its whole emotion all emotions so once that is out that is over they talk for settlement with a more peaceful mind and that is what is required the mediator has to create an atmosphere in the mediation room which gives them the peace and it's a difficult process not a easy process some of the ten mediators including madam geeta ji who will address you kavita ji etc who have the practical experience of this field the job of the mediator is very very tough to to allow the parties to burst out their emotions is not easy to listen if the mediator is swayed by those emotions the settlement talks can break at any point of time therefore mediator has to listen very very patiently give counseling to the parties explain to them the legal provisions legal background the court system procedures increasing cost of the litigation the possibility of further appeals and revisions and the long lapse of time which will pass all this if properly explained with a proper atmosphere to the parties they will most likely see the sense behind settling their dispute through mediation process and that is where the mediator job really uh, starts in telling them that if you settle them this dispute in this manner like installments in one the decade when the need cases or a peaceful divorce by mutual consent or rejoining the matrimonial home with the disputes settled in a property disputes if there is there then in different manner custody matters are there we have seen so many cases in matrimonial disputes particularly where the children's psychology is so much disturbed that they do not even develop as normal persons or uh, people so we always without the children counsel the parties that look here your fight is for ego why you are spoiling their life when they grow up they will curse you both that what kind of parents we had who, who fought with each other like this and took us to court and all judges chambers and court system for this and that for our custody are we commodities this kind of psychology if it is developed 
in the children in matrimonial cases or family disputes imagine the kind of citizens we will create in them therefore settlement in these kind of social uh, uh, kind of uh, relationship or personal or family relationships is very very important and that is why time and again all courts right from uh, a trial just to supreme court we have we constantly endeavor we constantly try counsel the parties that please understand the situation pacify yourself all right burst out your emotions in the mediation room but please settle this dispute peacefully it is good for the society it is good good for the nation as such it is good for the judicial system as such now there are many many good uh, trainers and trained mediators in our system who understand this psychology this process very well and on national international levels various training programs conferences seminars are constantly held as continuing legal education for even for the trained mediators and that is what i was trying to tell you when i say sitting judge of madras i got we took the training for two weeks spread over two weekends we felt that yes it's very good to understand the nuances the fine difference of the process of mediation which is explained to us in 41 state and you young lawyers you young uh, graduates who are coming out to serve the society in the legal system must definitely understand this process is a part of the profession which is called a noble profession to serve the society legal profession my dear friends has produced the leaders of the country right from independence movement till now because this is the profession which allows you to have those leadership skills in yourself develop those leadership skills because you try to settle the dispute either in the court system or in adr process help the parties to what is the benefit of a resolution of a dispute tell me is nothing but acquiring the peace and peace is very necessary for any development majorly for economic development why we are all concerned about the ongoing war between russia and ukraine it is happening 5000 kilometers 10000 kilometers away from us but we feel concerned that if the peace of any part of the mother earth is disturbed to such a great extent the environmental problems the loss of human lives the property loss and god forbid if nuclear things happen we all may be affected therefore peace is not only necessary but it is we all should uh, make our earnest and sincere efforts to give peace to the disputants in the legal system who come to us for their professional services now other thing which i wanted to tell you about mediation in court system is that now a pre litigation mediation system is in place in all the mediation centers attached with the high courts and district courts of the country the pre litigation mediation is services are available the parties whenever there is some kind of dispute instead of directly filing the court cases in the courts uh, courts to which has the jurisdiction to decide the dispute can directly go to the uh, mediation centers and they can say or even if one party goes the other party will be summoned by the or called by the uh, centers and both parties will be uh, allowed to sit on the table and talk their uh, things out now this happens even in the police stations in the cases of uh, like dowry cases many of you might have heard section 498a of crpc those disputes just after marriage or even before marriage when that happens they disputes first the first party who goes to the uh, file complaint is the police station now that is also a place where the not only law but the judge made law in the judgments and why it is even the police authorities to make efforts for a mediation that is why all women police stations were created in all the police stations because in the females mostly wives would go there complaining against the husband's behavior or the family's behavior etc police will call them and say what is the real dispute let us talk it out don't file the fir immediately and efforts are made even there 
Now the system provides that even the trained mediators can be called there, and they can make efforts to uh, mediate the pre-judicial settlement. Fortunately, if that happens, see how much time and money and energy is saved for the parties. The, the peace can be restored in the family, and that family can perhaps with the good counseling, maybe spread over days and weeks or even months sometimes, can settle the dispute. If a, a broken family is a burden on the society, a peaceful society is an asset to the society. Peaceful family is an asset to the society. So that is that is what we should keep as in our mind as mediators that you are social engineers also. You have to contribute for the good society. For that, not only you have to become a good citizen and good person and good lawyer or good mediator, but you have to ensure by good counseling that the parties to the dispute settle their dispute as early as possible. Now, let me talk about, as since we were talking about uh, there being no formal law on the mediation, which is now in making before the parliament. The leading judgment, if you have not heard on the mediation, is Afcon's judgment. It is 2010. Let me give the citation for all of your kind of benefit. Afcon Infrastructure Limited versus Cherian Varke Construction Company. Citation is 2010, 8 SCC, page 24. Is two judges bench, Justice R. V. Ravindran and Justice J. Panchar. Justice Ravindran authored this judgment. And while dealing with the interpretation and the uh, language of section 89, also the suggestions were made that section 89 is not very happily worded. They suggested some corrections in the draft of that judgment, uh, the provision also that happened. But now, besides while doing so, what is of your concern as a student or a young lawyer of the mediation is this, uh, that uh, the court laid down the illustrative list of the disputes which can be referred to the mediation and which cannot be referred to the mediation. So you should be aware of both these things. Even if you have read that, let me reiterate it for your kind benefit. The ADR process in section 89 being referred to elaborately because section 89 has been a non-starter with the many courts. That's what I said. Despite the provision being there, mediation system or mediation process is not that much popular which should be. Now, of course, with the effort of all concerned persons, it is increasing. But still, we are uh, shorter than the target. Uh, because section 89 has been non-starter with many courts, though the process under 89 appears to be lengthy and complicated, in practice the process is simple. That is, know the dispute, exclude unfit cases, ascertain consent for arbitration or conciliation or mediation. If there is no consent, select Lokadalat because Lokadalat is another adjudicatory body under Legal Service of the Act 1987 for simple cases and mediation for all the cases. So, court is clearly preferring mediation over even local adults, reserving reference to a judge assisted settlement only in exceptional uh, special cases. Judicial settlement section 89 is one clause is there. But that, as I said, it involves the court throughout. That is a less preferred kind of ADR system. If the reference to the ADR process fails on receipt of the report of the ADR from the court, shall proceed to hear the suit. This is a, a slightly different aspect. I'll give you this. Yes, that is on uh, page 28 of the SEC. The following categories of the cases are normally considered to be not suitable for ADI process having regard to their nature. Now listen to these categories where you cannot refer a civil dispute also to the mediation process or ADI system in the uh, section 89. Number one, representative source under Order 1, Rule 8 of CPC, which involves public interest or interest of numerous persons who are not parties before the court. Representative suit, I believe you understand. It is filed on behalf of the public at last. PIA jurisdiction you must have heard these days. Likewise, CPC also provided for representative suit in Order 1, Rule 8 CPC. That cannot be referred to mediation because larger people are involved, numbers are there. 
Two disputes relating to election to public office. You can't refer election petition to the mediation because that's a uh, where the state is involved and constitutional obligations are there that you can't refer. Third, cases involving grant of authority by the court after inquiry, for example, suit for grant of probate or letter of admission, this can't be done. You by consent, you can't get a probate. Cases involving serious and specific allegations of fraud, fabrication of documents, this can't be done. Uh, cases involving uh, uh, cases requiring protection of the court, for example, claims against minor DTs, mentally challenged, and suit for declaration of title, etc. This also cannot be done. Cases involving prosecution of criminal offenses. Now, criminal offenses, one exception is there for mediation. The offenses which are compoundable, as enumerated in Section 320 of the CRPC, or even some of the exceptions like 498A, 138, etc., which are not compoundable by judge made law. They have been made compound. So even those criminal uh, trials disputes can be referred to mediation. This is a very important point which you should know. Now, all other suits and cases of civil nature in particular, the following categories of cases where pending in civil courts or very special tribunals or forums are normally suitable for EDR process. Now I am giving you eight or ten categories which suits are most suitable for mediation process. All cases relating to trade, commerce, and contracts. Now, this is a very vast field. If all dispute of contractual nature in a trade or business can be referred to mediation, this can take away large burden of the courts. Now, we have commercial courts also in place under the 2015 Act. Even that Act advises us mediation before trial. So, there are some laws now in place with the evolution of the law of mediation which mandatorily requires the parties to try mediation before going for a trial. So this trade commerce contracts are taken care. Then all cases arising from strained or sold relationships, including matrimonial causes, maintenance, custody of children, disputes relating to partition, division of the family members, co-persons, etc. Now, most of the family disputes revolve around the matrimony or property. All these kinds of disputes, including custody of the children, are referable to mediation centers and they are the uh, main share of the cake of this uh, mediation centers. Most difficult to solve also, but still they are there. Third, all cases where there is a need for continuation of pre-existing relationship in spite of disputes like easement rights, encroachments, nuisances, dispute of employer employees, dispute among members of societies, associations, etc. So all these uh, disputes of chair and post, even in societies and trusts, etc. can go. All cases relating to tortuous liability, including claims for compensation in motor vehicle accidents and other accidents. Motor accidents, unfortunately, in our country is also a very, very major concern for the courts. And the law also requires quick compensation and courts are also trying their best to give a fair compensation to the victims of the accidents, including death cases. Even those cases can be sorted or settled through the mediation process. And uh, next category is all consumer disputes, including disputes where a trader or supplier manufacturers is keen to maintain his business professional reputation and credibility or production activity. So even these Consumer Forums Act cases can very well go there. Now, this is a the court with this list gives a clear caveat or a clear uh, disclaimer that these lists are not exhaustive. They say that almost all kinds of civil disputes are definitely good for trying for settlement at uh, true mediation process. Now the question arises, what is the stage at which the mediation should be referred is the usual question which the young lawyers will ask. The law generally provides that mediation should be referred, the court should refer the mediation at the stage before commencement of the trial. That is before recording the evidence, before framing the issues. The moment you file a plaint in the civil case, a written statement or counter of the other side respondent or defendant comes. Now, before framing the issues, you can advise the parties that this is a dispute which in the opinion of the court has the elements of settlement. That is all. The court has to just prima facie have a look at the dispute which the court understands the moment it sees the nature of disputes and the readings to this extent. 
and if it says that there are elements of settlement available in this dispute if the parties give their consent we can refer this dispute as such at this stage to the mediation center and there you go trade mediators will be available to assist you in settlement process the law does not prohibit the reference to the mediation at any stage even at the appellate stage there are cases which have been referred to mediation even at the supreme court appeal stage particularly in family disputes where the cases reach after 20 30 40 years the young couple who started the fight become old people the court the courts with a great sense of remorse say that at least please now put an end to this why why require a long judgment on this now either you part ways part ways peacefully if you rejoin rejoin peacefully by that time most of the ego is also out and over so this is how mediation at any stage for civil matters and minor criminal offenses is a good adr system now why it has not taken off in our country that's a concern for all mediation institution and even private mediation centers which uh, now uh, coming up like a good professional practice in the country mostly i believe friends with my little experience is lot of inertia i would say the courts who are overburdened with the cases do not apply their mind for even a short period to see or to discuss with the parties and councils that if settlement elements are available why don't you advise your parties to go for this idea now this has to be substituted by a proactive approach on the part of the lawyers and trial judges because they are the two key persons or i would say institutions who can boost or assist this movement to a very very large extent as a sitting judge on four high courts i have done i have referred so many cases to mediation center even if the earlier mediation had failed we say now the time has passed now some perhaps good sense can prevail why don't you try and 20 30 percent of those references even at the military stage succeeded so good even at that stage because even against the high court judgment an appeal lies to supreme court another 10 years goes a lot of money goes so why don't you settle it land disputes family disputes loan transactions all these things can be settled so first thing is that the lawyers community and even the referral judges we call them that may be high court or trial court should take up this adr system in a very very proactive manner and you young lawyers and young graduates or lawyers in making also have to understand the entire background of this concept of adr or mediation and by the time you come in the professional practice you will have a good law in place where you will be adequately compensated also for your professional services so why not uh, adopt this system uh, as a as a uh, good uh, legal practice in your law firms or law offices number one number two the mediators also with i think little more training or little more orientation or little more vigorous efforts have to ensure have to provide that atmosphere good counseling that more and more settlements take place as of now on an average we see that the success rate of mediation cases is about uh, 20% or 25% except few places like bangalore delhi madras where the success rate is little more because of the good trained mediators we have we, i have worked in bangalore and madras both the places where i have visited those centers and i i had the team of good mediators like mr shriram panchu mr jawad kavita balakrishnan all these fellows uma ramnathan who who did a great job devoted themselves entirely to this process and the results were wonderful so that is why friends uh, 
I, with my little experience of last uh, 16 years as a judge and uh, overall 40 years as a professional, can definitely vouch for this that young lawyers of my country should uh, definitely uh, go for this uh, legal practice in a very, very sincere and dedicated manner. And as a former judge or a former, a, 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 now I'm a lawyer again. So I'm part of the process again now. And we all should uh, make concerted efforts for uh, mediation to mediation movement to become uh, a, a great thing in our profession. And the ultimate objective, as I said earlier, is the peace of the society, the harmony of the society, the good relationship of the uh, parties. Because you see, once the settlement is there, the with the, the emotions uh, in the form of tears coming out of the brothers or husband, wife, and this and that, is the greatest success or satisfaction which a mediator has as a lawyer. So that is what you should keep in mind. And that is why this profession is called a noble profession that you contribute to these kind of settlements in the system. With these, uh, I think uh, my time is also coming to close and I should leave some time for the Q&A and if the other speaker has to take her session first, I will listen to her and also with interest and uh, then answer all your queries in the chat box. Or also. So thank you very much for all patient listening to a judge also. They hardly get into the question. Thank you, sir. It was a really a very wonderful session and uh, your inputs were very helpful. I think uh, definitely you have a vast experience in the field of law in this profession and uh, we have a lot of young students and young teachers as well and we find that even if we, like we are also teaching here at the faculty of law but at times we also come across a number of cases number of conflicts through our legal aid center legal aid clinic and definitely the inputs shared by you will help all of us in uh, bringing more mediation and more conflict resolution and uh, lessening the burdens of the court as such because we know the benefits of mediation as well so let us hope that uh, people take up mediation very seriously and uh, we uh, we go more into mediation because that is what our culture and our dharma always taught us uh, in uh, our country. Because so, mediation, I know, started with Lord Krishna going yes. to Gauravad and saying, please settle, give them even five villages, they will be happy. I, I assure you, unfortunately, that did not happen. A failed mediation. It's a case of failed mediation. Had they agreed, we would not have had Mahabharat. Mahabharat, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Sir, I would now request Ms. Parul Singh to take over the session now. Thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, indeed, sir, mediators are social engineers who make uh, so much effort so that parties, you know, they can settle their uh, disputes as soon as possible. And uh, as you said, a peace in the family is an asset uh, to the society. So thank you so much, sir, for enlightening our audience with your knowledge and experience. And uh, now I request uh, Ms. Kavita Bhatia, Assistant Professor, Faculty of Law, to introduce our second keynote speaker for today's session, Dr. Geetanjali Prabhu Shetty. Over to you, madam. After such a wonderful session, I would like to introduce the, another speaker for this webinar. First of all, I would like to uh, welcome you all and I wish you a very good morning to all. Ple pleasure for, for me, me to introduce our esteemed speaker for the second session of the webinar, Dr. Gitanjali Prabhu Shetty, Advocate Mediator. Dr. Gitanjali Prabhu holds a degree master in law and has pursued a doctorate in environmental law from the Department of Law, University of Mumbai. Madam's professional career encompasses a vast experience as a legal counsel and has independent chamber practice in the Mumbai High Court since 2006. The litigation practice solely focuses on civil litigation and is spread across dispute resolution with special focus to mediation. Other areas of practice are banking, real estates, uh, then uh, commercial contracts, private mediation, other areas of practice and banking. It also includes real estate uh, disputes, commercial contracts, private equity and investments, uh, sec uh, securitization, then uh, corporate law, cooperative societies, trust uh, disputes, estate planning, testamentary and personal law, etc. Apart from her professional career, she has also an academician. She has been a visiting faculty uh, with the Department of Law, Mumbai University for a decade. 
to the student of LLM and uh, the subjects of expertise includes jurisprudence, uh, constitutional law and environmental law. Madam has also uh, industry experience uh, and she has worked with Ms. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Gagret and company uh, solicitors. Madam has been a part of the chamber of uh, noted senior counsel, Chartered Uday Singh. She has been notified by the state government as an assistant government leader on the original side, High Court Mumbai. She is an experienced arbitrator and an internationally certified trained mediator. She has been appointed as an arbitrator and mediator in several cases by the High Court Mumbai, including private and court annex uh, arbitrations and mediation. Ma'am's contribution in the field of alternative dispute resolution is noteworthy. She has completed various training programs in mediation like Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs, International Certification Course in Mediation from CAMP, Edwards Mediation Academy, CAUS, and Center of Dis Dispute Resolution, uh, Santa Monica, California in 2019 by the world-renowned mediator Kenneth Clark. To the of you. Madam holds many prestigious positions uh, that includes uh, she has been appointed as a mediator uh, to the main mediation center, Mumbai High Court. Uh, she has been an exec uh, executive committee of the mediation uh, committee of the Indian uh, Merchant Chamber. Uh, she is a uh, member of Association of uh, Mediation Practitioners, Mumbai. Uh, she has. Uh, she is also vice president of Mediators India Western Region. Madam has been regularly uh, invited by various institutions and law colleges to judge and advise the uh, moot mediations, including uh, Pravin Gandhi College of Law (NMIMS), Kirit Mehta Law School, Maharashtra National uh, Law University from Mumbai and Indian Law Society's Center for Arbitration and Mediation, Mude. Also Symbiosis Hyderabad, NLIU Bhopal and Jodhpur. I trust that the session would be really fruitful for all of our aspirants of ATR. Over to you, Gidanjali Ma'am. Uh, thank you so much, Kavita. Mm, uh, that was really a long drawn, uh, you know, recount of all the uh, little nuances which I could inculcate in the experience of my life. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, my first duty to your esteemed university, uh, I thank Honorable the Vice Chancellor of the Maharaja Sayaji Rao University of Baroda. I thank Uma Ma'am, the uh, Officer on Special Duty and the Webinar Director uh, of the esteemed university. I have greatest pleasure being in the auspicious presence of His Lordship, the Honorable Dr. Justice Vinit Kotahari. Uh, I also am grateful for Namrata Luhar, the coordinator, Kavita Bhatia, the coordinator of the webinar, my colleagues, Kavita Balakrishnan, ICS team, presence here of Jawad, uh, JP Singh, all my gurus in the profession of mediation, and I thank you one and all for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, at the outset, I am also very pleased to do the topic. And it has given me an opportunity to delve into this topic a little bit on detail, though I would have only known it superficially otherwise. So thank you one and all. Without wasting much time, my topic for today is Unicitral and the Singapore Convention the importance and significance of it. So this is our topic for the day, importance of UNICITRAL and Singapore Convention. So uh, first and foremost, we need to know, uh, I have gone a little bit in depth to find out what is UNICITRAL. We keep saying UNICITRAL. So what is UNICITRAL? United Nations Commission on International Trade Law. So it is basically a commission, a part of the United Nation, which deals with international trade law. Why do we need something um, at a United Nations level when each of us as a state has something within our state? Gita Simply because Sorry to interrupt. we need a uniform law with regard to trade law so that all of us feel as though we are under the banner of one state, one um, where uniformly things can be conducted 
so as it is when you enter into transactions between people from other countries the nuances of all the trade customs is itself a problem it, amongst that to you know uh, negotiate laws to go through uh, relatively strange um, uh, people in that country becomes all the more difficult so what does unicitral do first a little bit on unicitral it is a subsidiary body of the un general assembly it was established in 1966 it happens to be the core legal body of the un system in the field of unis uh, in the field of trade law sorry now why unicitral as i rightly said a few moments ago for the modernization and harmonization of rules on international business to facilitate international trade and investment so if we have a particular trade law uh, if the trade law is common there are so many countries in the world today each of the each of the country has a particular domestic law prevailing in their country we as denizens we as citizens of the country find it very difficult to even know domestic law ignorance of law then is no excuse so what about ignorance of international law to make things simple to have some authority which can take control and uniform the law harmonize the laws that are prevailing make it easy for us to uh, do trade and to in, uh, improve economic in the uh, world we have what you call as unicitral so it does a progressive harmonization unification what does its mandate cover mandate meaning what all comes within the scope of its function so definitely dispute resolution international contract practices transport insolvency electronic commerce international payments secure transaction so whenever there is a problem in any area which needs a resolution the member countries come together address those issues and then come out with a um a, a solution which should be um universally accepted unicitral has a membership which uh, in terms of what we can say it is uniformly represented throughout the earth so asia is rep represented europe is represent just to cover the needs and um, uh, uniformity required in the world at large now the singapore convention and model law similarly unicitral the commission came to an understanding that for some reason arbitration has gone a long way after the new york convention a work a working committee was set up so the working committee was given a draft while it was working on the draft of a model law it was also given the task of coming out with a convention uh, to uh, uh, get rid of the issues of cross border disputes what are cross border disputes we'll come in a little moment of time so here in may 2014 united states maybe which which had the highest uh, number of uh, international trade going on in terms of uh, volume prompted a debate it asked the un unicitral's working group that it needs to address this issue of enforceability of international contracts and that is the time when the working commission for the first time in the history of unicitral started working on two drafts simultaneously one a model law and one the singapore convention which later came to be known as we can call it convention because it was given open for signature at singapore we started calling at it as a singapore convention so now what is the meaning of a model law as we are aware we have a companies act i'm just giving an analogy in the companies act we have a bylaw which we can uh, refer to if we uh, any company doesn't have its own bylaws so if we are given a draft of a model bylaw a person who is unaware of all the nuances which goes into that bylaw can adopt bylaws which are agreeable to them or dif uh, uh, make distinctive changes in the bylaws which they feel are necessary for themselves so model bylaws work as something which are drafted by experts as the basic need required in that area of practice so similarly we have a model law 2018 on mediation 
the model law was adopted alongside the singapore convention at that time the commission that is the unicetral recommended that all states should give a favorable con uh, consideration to the enactment of this model law simply because the commission was worried the commission was concerned about uniformity the more the world is unified the more the uh, we have uniform laws it will that part of the um, businessman's woes will be taken care of they can concentrate on their transaction peacefully they know that whatever uh, transactions they and uh, go into it will be in case the creases will be ironed out because there is a uniform law in place and that goes a long way in giving encouragement and support to businessmen uh, in international agreements going over to my next slide what does unicetral ultimately aim for so as i said unicetral aims for a modern fair harmonized rules in commercial transaction what does it do? how does it achieve that by conventions model laws rules which are accepted worldwide it acts as a legal and legislative guide and gives practical recommendations updated information on case law all over the world so we have a comparison so when judges sit on a, a topic maybe in any state of india or the supreme court we they have before them the judgments uh, cited by the un the judgments brought to the fore and why such a particular point was uh, tackled in such a way why was decision reached in such a way so that that becomes a guide for the world over enactments Uh, just like i said about model law similarly we have enactment so if we are in today for a mediation law we have to pick from the singapore convention we have to pick from the model laws because they will be the standing uh, tried and tested um, uh, sections tried and tested uh, provisions which are uh, there for take but we can always make a necessary change so that it suits our economy it suits our a um, specialized culture technical assistance in law reform projects so the un is always there if you have any law reform project to undertake the un will always um, uh, grant its assistance in whatever way possible regional national seminars it will help you to have uh, um, give uh, scope encourage any topic for example if we have a mediation topic which needs to have further deliberations which need to be spread at the grassroots level un in all its um, way can help us achieve that now we finally come to the convention though it was called the singapore convention it was originally the original name is united nations convention on international settlement agreements resulting from mediation in short called as the singapore convention or simply right now convention the united nations convention was adopted now there's a date of adoption it was adopted on the 20th of december 2018 whereafter on 7th august 2019 it was kept open in singapore at the united nations headquarters for signing what is signing will come a little later now why a convention so as i was saying a little while before we had what you call as a new york convention the new york convention was basically for arbitration and it was felt that after the uniformity which was provided by the new york convention arbitration really leaped in bounds everywhere arbitration went on a big high with people um, businessmen preferring arbitration to litigation any day and the only reason was the new york convention because they felt that there is a unified structure which the parties who had signed will definitely adopt but the parties the countries who have not signed will definitely take as a guideline and that gave them a complete set of confidence to go ahead with arbitration now when you thought about mediation and now mediation has also suddenly taken up the world over in place of the originally used term conciliation so when it was seen when the working commission sat down together they felt that the only reason why mediation was not taking the push that arbitration was taking is because there was no uniform law 
in commercial mediation on an international scale. Let me give you a small example. For example, A and B will enter into a settlement. Now A, after the settlement is reached, A wishes to enforce that settlement in B state. Now the laws prevailing in B state is completely different. There is no enforcement law. So what will B ha A have to do? A will have to file a domestic proceeding. The judges there, the laws being different will come to a different outcome. And after um, there may be a, a, a judgment even against him. So looking at all this and the advice that he receives on this count, they will be a lot hesitant to enter into a mediation, uh, to enter into a business proposal, a commercial proposal with Mr. B. So to get rid of that, to encourage them, these are the key features of the convention. So the first, the convention will apply to internet, so commercial settlement agreements, which are of an international nature, but it will not uh, apply to settlement agri uh, 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 agreements that are concluded in the course of, so therefore, if you have a judicial decree, if you have a judicial judgment, it is kept out. So court and ex mediations are kept out of the purview of the convention. Again, arbitrations are kept out of the purview of uh, this convention. So what will happen is, uh, apart from this, it will only apply to commercial settlement agreements. Therefore, it will not apply if any of the parties there to have a personal family household dispute to be brought into display, like consumer inheritance, family employment law, it won't apply. It will only apply if when and where both the parties are into a commercial settlement, commercial dispute. So does what? Thus, the Singapore Mediation Convention was established as an interna international framework to give recognition to international settlement agreement that only result from international commercial arbitration. Now, why are the conventions binding? Convention is an unwritten understanding about how something in parliament should be done, which although not legally enforceable, is almost universally absorbed. I would like to give you an analogy. Now, under the Constitution of India, we have what you call as a fundamental rights, but we also have what you call as a directive principles. Now, along with uh, fundamental rights is mandatory. Fundamental rights is justiciable, whereas directive principles of state policy is non-justiciable. What is the difference? Difference is that the moment a fundamental right is infringed, we can immediately take up a uh, procedure, we can enter court. In case of directive principles of state policy, we cannot go to court, but they are guiding factors to the legislators, to the government, to use them as binding principles to reach um, uh, legislative decisions. Similarly, convention is once again a guiding factor when we have to adopt something which will be universally applicable. Now we come to the preamble. I have set out the preamble in its originality to give us an understanding as to how it is framed. So it says that the parties to the convention, they recognize that the value of international trade in mediation as a method of settling commercial disputes in which parties in dispute request a third person to assist them in their attempt to settle the dispute amicably. So it recognizes that there are two parties in dispute and they want to refer a, their dispute to a amicably to a third person who will assist them to come to a solution. They have also noted that mediation is increasingly, this is a big, big thumbs up that a universal document, that a global document is um, agreeing, is um, um, asserting that mediation is now increasingly used in international and domestic, uh, domestic commercial practice as an uh, effective tool of ADR. Now, what does it consider? It considers that mediation, the use of mediation is definitely results in significant benefits, such as reducing the instances where dispute leads to term termination of commercial relationship, facilitating the administration of international transaction by commercial and producing savings. It is convinced that the establishment of a framework 
will definitely be acceptable to all states and will contribute to bringing the laws on mediation especially international commercial arbitration on a harmonious level and therefore they are going to agree with the following clauses the uh, the first article which is article 1 has the first clause article 11 states that this convention applies to agreement resulting from mediation concluded in writing to resolve a commercial dispute which at the time of its conclusion is international so therefore it says that uh, it will define a little later what is international but firstly it says that this is a convention which applies only to an agreement so there are certain conditions uh, for this so if, number 1 it must be to an agreement resulting from mediation it must be concluded in writing by the parties and their writing should be that they resolve their commercial dispute and at the time of uh, conclusion it must be international now what is the meaning of international they have given it out in a and b out at least two parties to the set madam you got muted ma'am gitanjali ma'am hello yes yes ma'am it is audible now it is audible, audible. yes ma'am thank you okay. there is someone who's raised his hand does he have a query uh, students having queries they can put their questions in the chat box uh, okay. mr Sorry, I'll sayad ali yeah. i'll can i'll can so for uh, to repeat myself the term international is explained here what it says is at least two parties to the settlement agreement have their places of business in different states so if we have parties where their place of business is within india it can't be called international but if one of us uh, a and b either of a and b has a place say in singapore in hong kong or etc definitely their business will be termed as international if tomorrow they have a dispute that dispute will become um, come within the purview of uh, international it is very different to what we can call um, in uh, uh, arbitration in arbitration it is the place of sitting of the tribunal that is considered to be uh, whether it is domestic or international so suppose you have a uh, tribunal uh, arbitration tribunal sitting in singapore definitely that is a international whereas if you have a tribunal sitting within mumbai or within india that is called as a domestic arbitrary so it is the situs of the place in arbitration whereas here it is basically the settlement agreement which will decide uh, whether it is international or not at that therefore it will come when after the dispute is resolved and after the agreement is signed at that point of time if either of the parties have has a business um in a different uh, state in state here when we talk in a convention means a country state means a country b the state in which parties to the settlement agreement have their places of business in different that is either the state in which a substantial part of the obligation on the settlement agreement is this is akin to in civil procedure code when you decide jurisdiction so when we say a part of the cause of action a major part of the cause of action or where the defendant resides similarly the here it says about the settlement agreement the parties to a settlement agreement having their places of business in different plus either the state in which substantial part of the obligation under the settlement agreement is performed should be different or the state with which the subject matter of the settlement agreement is mostly connected so either a substantial part of the obligation or where the subject matter of the settlement agreement is i will uh, i have um, uh, uh, you know summarized it in one of the slides a little later it will be more um, easier to understand it article 1 2 what is the scope of the application so now this is article 1 clause 2 this convention does not apply to settlement agreement concluded to resolve a dispute arising from transaction engaged in one of the parties so this is what we went through earlier only international commercial transaction not applicable to even if either party has a dispute with regard to uh, for him 
or for her it will be a personal it will be a family or it will be a household purpose this convention won't apply so whether it is also relating to inheritance or employment these um disputes are kept out of the scope of the convention 13 so again this convention does not apply like we said earlier to a court or conclu uh, conclusive judgment Uh, of a proceeding in court, so court annexed judgments, orders arrived at in court annexed mediation will be out of the purview of um, this convention. That are enforceable as a judgment in the state of that court, uh, what, uh, as we earlier said. Settlement agreements that have been recorded and are enforceable as uh, so uh, judgments which you have reached in a litigating matter in court or a settlement uh, or in the uh, mediation. settlement agreements which are recorded as an arbitral award so arbitration award judgments arrived at will be out of the purview of the convention this is the uh, summary of article 1 article 1 thus provides that the convention applies to international settlement agreements resulting from mediation concluded in writing by parties to resolve a commercial dispute article 1 list the exclusion from the scope of the convention namely settlement agreements concluded by a consumer for personal family or household purposes or relating to family inheritance employment law all these are outside the purview of the convention also a settlement agreement that is enforceable as a judgment or an arbitral award is also excluded from the scope of the convention now why in order to avoid a possible overlap with existing and future convention like we already have for arbitral award like i said the new york convention on the recognition and enforcement of foreign arbitral awards the convention on choice of court agreements 2005 the convention on the recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments in civil or commercial matters now they don't want to overlap because those are existing conventions they have set out the uniformity the harmonization in those areas we now need to harmonize unify understand um, to bring about some conformity in the uh, uh, commercial uh, mediation uh, international commercial mediation so this um, uh, singapore convention restricts itself to commercial mediation only at an international level that is cross border disputes therefore we have um, understood article 1 uh, this again i have just summarized article 1 uh, to um you know uh, reiterate what was said about being international uh, uh, when can a uh, transaction be international only settlement agree um, agreement is international if either parties have businesses in different countries or the place of business is different from the country in which a substantial part of the obligation is to be performed or the country with which the subject matter is closely related either one of this has to be compulsorily there for it to be come within the purview of international now we come to article 2 definitions now there are certain definitions provided uh, in article 2 uh, which are going to be having the meaning for the purposes of the convention so one of them if a party has more than one place of business the relevant place of the relevant place of business Uh, is that which has the closest relationship to the dispute resolved by the settlement agreement so if we have more than one place of agreement it is been clarified in the convention that the relevant place will be the closest relationship to the dispute between those many places it could be 10 it could be 12 so uh, like businesses which have running accounts so there are so many cases we come across where a and b have running accounts with various um, so they have um, uh, mumbai running account um, uh, gujarat running account uh, khandala running account and this running account and that running account when a dispute arises in those accounts in those businesses the place closest to uh, the for the purpose of business will be considered as the relevant place for the uh, settlement agreement if a party does not have a place of business reference is to be made to the parties habitual uh, with online thing going on in such a vast scale there are so many of us who do hybrid work 
there are so many of us now who have only taken to online uh, working and mostly online working is from home or from uh, a part of the home to save the uh, uh, trouble of uh, you know travel so this is taking care of that if a party does not have a place of business reference is to be made to the party's habitual place of residence one wonderful story uh, i mean uh, significance of this convention is the definition of mediation and it is um, provided in very lucid and simple format it it it, it is said to be a process irrespective of the okay so if, if you call a document by whatever name you like but when you read the contents of the document the document will bear that color so you may uh, call the document a gift but when you read it actually you will come to know that it is actually a uh, leave license agreement simply termed as a gift so mediation is a process irrespective of the term used so it has uh, increased the scope but what are the um, requirement what are the fundamental which the convention requires where parties attempt to reach an amicable settlement of the dispute with the assistance of a third person the mediator who lacks the authority to impose a solution on the parties to the dispute that is very important so um, firstly there should be a dispute the dispute is referred for amicable settlement to the assistance of a third person or persons but these persons appointed as mediators they lack the authority to impose a solution on the parties to the dispute uh now we come to article 3 which is the general principle each party shall uh, just give me a moment each party to the convention shall enforce a settlement agreement in accordance with its rules and procedure under the uh, conditions laid down in the so these are the general uh, principles laid down for the purposes of the parties to uh, take it as a guiding factor if a dispute arises concerning a matter that a party claims was already resolved by a settlement agreement uh, in accordance with its rules and procedure under the in order to prove that the matter is already resolved now what is the meaning of all that article 3 makes it mandatory for the parties to enforce a settlement agreement resulting from international commercial mediation so initially you could um, uh, just have a uh, settlement between the parties but because uh, they did not have a uniform place to go and enforce this and it would be very cumbersome to go into the country of one of the parties uh, file a domestic dispute get an order that order could be very different and against them so parties would reach a settlement and just merely keep it with themselves without, without going in for an enforcement article 3 changes that it makes it mandatory for parties to enforce settlement agreement what does it do further it addresses the key obligation of parties with respect to both enforcement and the right of the disputing party to invoke a settlement agreement so it provides a settlement um, um solution which is a complete uh, which infuses a complete confidence in parties now to enter into a business transaction without hesitating on the issues of uh, enforcement secondly it gives the right of a dispute um, uh, to invoke the settlement agreement so i have given here an example if example a and b have signed ratified the conven convention then their domestic laws are inconsistent Uh, with the convention which resolves the issues of in enforceability now all that a and b will have to do is file enforcement proceedings in the domestic court so earlier when we had a and b if when they reach a mediated settlement in a commercial matter both are from different countries as i said a will have to go into b's country file a domestic application there in the domestic court get the matter heard and then Uh, say that we have reached a conclusion on this matter which may for example may not be even according to the laws of that country and may come as a hindrance and then they may have to again think about you know changing those clauses which could be a little a draining on uh, the parties whereas today after the convention is in place what a and b have to do is 
A has to merely file enforcement proceedings and immediately the agreement will get enforced. So um, three gives you um, um, a mandatory requirement to enforce because today it has given you a clear cut, simple step to enforce it by following enforcement proceedings. You don't have to go ahead and first file a, a proceeding in the domestic court, then get a judgment, then go for execution or enforcement. No, you right now you have to straight uh, start with an enforcement proceeding. So on one hand, Article 3 makes it mandatory for you to enforce international commercial uh, agreements. Secondly, it gives you an easy way to do it and it gives you um, a, a, a chance, it gives you a power to invoke those settlement agreements. Now, what are the requirements of, there are certain mandatory requirements for um, the settlement agreements. Now, what are they? Your settlement agreement to be uh, applicable, to be, to, 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 to be considered as a settlement agreement under this convention uh, requires certain uh, conditions shall supply to the competent authority of the party to the convention where relief is sought. So if A has a relief against B and is wanting to enforce in country B um, uh, the uh, settlement agreement, the competent authority there will require one settlement agreement signed by the party. So obviously in writing evidence that the settlement agreement has resulted in mediation such as now how will you know that it was reached through mediation obviously the mediator signature on the settlement agreement a document signed by the mediator indicating that the mediation was carried out an attestation by the institution that administered mediation or in the absence of all this any other evidence acceptable to the competent authority. So any, if you carried out institutional mediation, then even if the institution gives it to you in writing that, um, uh, you know, um, mediators in, uh, I mean, Indian Merchant Chamber conducted this particular mediation, uh, it was conducted on these many dates, parties, um, uh, the lawyer attended on these dates, parties attended on these dates, there was a caucus on these dates, etc, etc. Immediately, um, and it is in writing and it is signed by the mediator who conducted and said that I was present at all these uh, will completely fulfill the needs and requirements of Article 4. The, uh, what does Clause 2 say? The requirement that a settlement agreement shall be signed by the parties or where applicable the mediator is met in relation to electronic communication Therefore, now we bring in the picture of online dispute resolution where parties conduct meetings on Zoom, where parties reach agreements on Zoom, bringing the world closer and into a small a place where we all can, uh, you know, have the advantages of being together. So how? If a method is used to identify the parties or the mediator and to indicate the parties or mediator's intention in respect of the information contained in the electronic communication. That means B, the method used is either an reliable as appropriate for the purpose for which electronic communication was generated or communicated in the light of all the circumstances, including any relevant agreement, proven in fact to have fulfilled the function as described in para A. What is that? That the method used by the parties was mediation, that there was a dispute pending in between them and parties used mediation and a, a, a neutral arbit a mediator to reach a settlement. If these things can be uh, easily uh, proved by using that method of electronic communication, then that electronic communication would be considered legible or recognized. Three, uh, if the settlement agreement is not in the official language of the party to the convention where relief is sought, the competent authority may request a language. Obviously, so suppose we have, uh, as we say, A and B, and they uh, reached an agreement, a settlement agreement in English, but they wanted to enforce it in party B in Japan. So therefore, obviously, uh, th uh, this little clause is provided for, for that purpose. The competent authority may require any necessary document in order to verify that the requirements of the convention have been met with, just so that 
all the nuances of the uh, and the requirements and the preconditions of the convention are met a document may be uh, um, sought for by the competent authority that kindly uh, and each country may be uh, each competent authority of different countries may have their own requirements wanting that number one whether um, uh, it uh, you know it was the place closest to your business uh, it is international in nature it is only a commercial transaction parties have adopted uh, you know mediation techniques to reach mediation etc etc so as long as it complies with the convention the clauses of the convention uh, the competent authority can ask for any requirement when considering the request for relief the competent authority shall uh, act expeditiously so the only difference why parties today are going in for arbitration going in for mediation going in for other uh, uh, tools of adr is simply because of this reason expeditiously so where in courts we are waiting for tens and um, uh, more years to reach a um, you know to get a judgment in our favor to get a judgment otherwise it is the adr tool which is helping us to resolve and get on with our lives as expeditiously as possible again i have for the um, uh, just to you know summarize the whole article article 4 covers the formalities for relying on a settlement agreement namely the disputing party shall supply to the competent authority the settlement agreement signed by them and evidence that the settlement agreement results from mediation the competent authority may require any necessary document in order to verify that the requirements of the convention are met with now we come to article 5 now there are certain um, events listed in article 5 when Uh, the uh, uh, relief may be denied by the uh, competent authority now what are they the competent authority of the party to the convention where relief is sought under article 4 may refuse to grant relief at the request of the party if the party furnishes uh, fails to furnish i mean only if the party that is only if the party furnishes to the con- proof that a party to the settlement agreement was under some incapacity the settlement agreement sought to be relied upon is null and void inoperative this is akin to section 34 of the uh, arbitration and conciliation act so once a, a, a arbitration award is passed uh, parties are allowed only very limited grounds to challenge the award similarly grants for uh, if uh, you have a settlement agreement between a and b a goes all the way to b um, country to enforce that agreement then the competent authority may consider any of these grounds alone to uh, refuse granting of such relief to party a and what are they so party a was under some incapacity or that the settlement agreement sought to be relied upon is null and void inoperative incapable of being performed under the law to which the parties have validly subjected to it Fa- uh, failing any indication there or under the law applicable to the competent authority or to the convention where relief is sought second it is not binding the settlement agreement is not binding is not final according to its term there are certain preconditions to have been fulfilled there are certain um, you know um, 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 uh, clauses which depend on the happening of some event etc has been subsequently modified so if a uh, agreement is modified then the competent authority will obviously need the modified copy of the agreement and not this agreement a settlement agreement which is put forth before him the obligations in the settlement agreement have been performed and or they are not clear or they are not comprehensible or are incomprehensible further grounds granting relief would be contrary to the terms of the settlement agreement there was a serious breach by the mediator of standards applicable to the mediator the mediation without which breach that party would not have entered into a settlement agreement there was a failure by the mediator to disclose to the party circumstances that raise justifiable doubts as to to the mediator's impartiality or independence and such failure to disclose had a material impact or undue influence or so if you know one of the parties if the mediator had known one of the parties or if the mediator had at, at some point of time uh, he was aware of that 
uh, you know transaction between the parties or he he had appeared in that matter in some you know some little minuscule way but he did not disclose it at the opening statement to the parties and that had come to the fore via 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 indirectly to one of the parties so he could use it as a ground because it 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 completely routes the confidence of the party in the um uh, settlement agreement so that could be again one ground uh, for refusing to grant relief by country b uh, there was serious breach by the mediator of standards applicable so there are applicable standards it could be in in, a, in any country it could be the applicable sta standards which are universally agreed upon say in this very convention or uh, um, uh, just general standards uh, of uh, you know um, um uh, uh, justice um, uh, to have been seen manifestly done or the ultra partum that is parties are heard um, you know there is complete um, um, uh, 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 rules of justice followed by the mediator a prima facie the mediator has to appear to be fair these are the international rules which have to be in any event followed uh two uh, that is article 5 grounds for refusing to grant relief clause 2 the competent authority of the party to the convention where relief is sought under article 4 may also refuse to grant relief if it finds that granting relief would be contrary to public policy of that party or the subject matter of dispute is not capable of settlement by mediation under the law of that party so for example compoundable offenses um, or um, you know uh, where um, evidentiary matters are led which have not yet been um, thrown open for mediation etc those kinds of matters of a particular country uh, which cannot have been referred to mediation on these grounds also public policy on these grounds also again uh, reliefs could be refused i have uh, summarized in my own way what article 5 um, says the convention defines in article 5 the grounds upon which a court may refuse to grant relief at the request of the disputing party against whom it is invoked these grounds can be grouped into three main categories namely in relation to the disputing parties settlement agreement or the mediation procedure so three grounds uh, three main categories one and with relation to disputing parties two settlement agreement and three mediation procedure article 5 includes two additional grounds upon which the court may on its own motion refuse to grant interim relief those grounds are number one public policy and fact that the subject matter of dispute cannot be settled by mediation now we come to parallel applications or claim article 6 now if an application or a claim relating to settlement application has been made to a court or an arbitral tribunal so parallel mediation litigating court an arbitral tribunal or any other competent authority which may affect the relief sort so like you know when you file any litig we are all aware when you file any application in court be it a writ be it a suit everywhere we have to make a statement on oath that this is the only place where i am seeking reliefs of this particular dispute and there is no other place or no other authority who is sitting on this dispute which is between us similarly uh, all parallel applications or claims we have to um, uh it may uh, it says that if it can adjourn the decision and may also on the request of a order the other party to give suitable security article 7 other laws and treaties this convention shall not deprive any interested party of any right it may have to avail itself of a settlement agreement in the manner and to the extent allowed by law or treaties of the party to the convention where such settlement agreement is sought to be relied upon meaning that with the aim to provide for the application of the most favorable framework for settlement agreement article 7 foresees the application of the more favorable law or treaty so it does not say that you know just because i am in force just because this convention is forced so i am the best option available to you i am the convention states that it it tries the unicetral has tried to give us a better platform but if 
we already have a better platform if we feel more comfortable with uh, any other alternative present than article 7 so it uh, if you approach the court or if you approach a competent authority with a, under any other alternative and you are asked the question that how come you are take, uh, you know adjudicating under this so article 7 comes to your aid and provides that other laws and treaties are also applicable article 8 now deals with certain reservations a party to the convention may declare that it shall not apply this convention to settlement agreements to which it is a party or to which any governmental agencies person acting on behalf of a governmental agency is a party to the extent specified so now you can make a reservation that parties may enter into an agreement saying that certain sections or the entire convention may not be applicable to us it shall apply this convention only to the extent that the parties to the settlement have agreed so the you can by agreement um so therefore no reservations are permitted ex or except and otherwise those expressly authorized in this article now, now what is what does treaty say reservations may be made by a party to the convention any time any time so you may enter into an agreement you may not be aware of the convention even at a time later date when you become aware of the convention then you can take in a clause to bring in the reservation reservations made at the time of the signature shall be subject to confirmation upon ratification acceptance or approval such reservation shall take effect simultaneously with the entry into force of this con convention in respect of the party to the convention concerned reservations made at the time of ratification acceptance or approval of this convention at the time of making a declaration under article 13 shall take so in, uh, effect immediately now there are countries uh, who may find that we have better laws in place there are countries who may say that you know um, uh, looking at the um, various clauses under the convention they may say that we have a better um, uh, you know system in place and so uh, we may not be uh, uh, required to take clause 1 clause 2 we don't sign the entire uh, convention we only sign the convention bereft of these two uh, uh, provision so that is allowed and how it is to be done at what point it can be done that is what is set out in uh, reservations reservations and their confirmation shall be deposited with the depository now who is a depository will come in article 10 any party to the convention that makes a reservation under this convention may also uh, withdraw it at any time such withdrawals are to be deposited with the dep depository and shall take effect 6 months after the deposit now suppose when you when we come to signing or ratification of this convention by different countries we will again do reservations so you may, uh, a country may sign uh, 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 the uh, singapore convention but it may reserve certain um uh, clauses and say that you know we are not very uh, agreeable with this clause because we have a better clause in place in our domestic law it may do so at the time of signing it may do so at a later date but how will it do it it will do it in writing and it will um uh, set this out and put it in the custody of the depository who is a depository we will be seeing in article 10 i have now um, summarized this article 8 includes the reservation a first reservation permits a party to the convention to exclude from application of the convention settlement agreements to which it is a party or to which any governmental agency any person acting on a behalf of a governmental agency is a party to the extent specified in the declaration so uh, what is the first reservation they can make they can say that this um, convention may apply to all international commercial arbitrations uh, commercial uh, arbitrations which are of an international nature it may apply but it 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 i we as a country reserve its application to tra commercial transactions where either uh, uh, the government is involved or transactions where some governmental agencies are involved or a person who is acting on behalf of the government is involved we reserve our right to have application of this uh, convention to those type of uh, transactions 
be that it may be international be that it may be a commercial transaction so this is the first reservation second reservation is permits a party to the convention that is any country to declare that it will apply to the convention only to the extent that the disputing party has agreed so first one a complete uh, reservation a complete um, uh, you know um, um, uh, abstinence but in the second case they may say that a particular extent to an extent they may make a choice to have it applied and how will they do it they will make it in writing the government for example india india wants to make certain reservations that they should not apply to government contracts they should not apply to um, uh, uh, governmental agencies or they should not apply to any person who is acting on behalf of the government then the indian government needs to put that in writing and needs to deposit this with the depository we come to now article 9 what is the effect on settlement agreement the convention and any reservation or withdrawal thereof shall apply only to settlement agreements concluded after the so it does not have a pros, um, it only has a prospective um, effect it does not go behind in time it is not retrospective in nature so concluded after the date of the con, uh, when the con convention reservation withdrawal enters into force so they have said that when you make a reservation when you withdraw the con, uh, reservation from the depository six months time will have to be given to make it applicable and you have to stick to that time lag the convention and any reservations there to apply prospectively to settlement agreements which have been concluded after the entry into force of the convention for the party concerned as provided in article 9 now we come to depository so who has been appointed as a depository the secretary general of the united nations is hereby designated as the depository of this convention now what is a depository in international law a depository is a government or an organization to which a multilateral treaty is entrusted the principal functions of a depository are codified in article 77 of the vienna convention on law of treaties it states that you know um, a, uh, the country on whom maximum trust or who is a, a neutral country in respect of that multilateral um, convention that uh, country may be given the uh, act of a depository now what are the functions of a depository let's see next one what are the responsibilities of a depository however let us not forget that our singapore convention the secretary general of the united nations has been designated as a depository the responsibilities of the depository the core depository function such as publishing archiving treaty texts organizing ceremonies of signature or ratification receiving and registering all acts relating to treaties notifying them to member states and other parties rarely give rise to particular legal issues in the sense what they are saying is that core duties of a depository are that if there is any publication to be done in respect of the convention if any treaty texts need to be archived if ceremonies need to be organized for signing ratifying uh, or receiving Uh, you know the reservations registering the reservations helping with withdrawal of reg reservations etc etc all this will be the function of the depository as i was saying there is a vast difference between uh, signature ratification acceptance approval accession and now that has been amply clarified in article 11 This convention is open for signature by all states in Singapore on 7th August 2019 and thereafter at United Nations headquarters in New York. This convention is subject to ratification, acceptance, approval by the signatories. Who will be the signatories? All the countries of the world will be the uh, can sign and accept ratify and accept the provisions of the convention. This convention is open for accession by all states that are not signatories as from the date it is open for signature in the sense that it will be open it will be accessible to all states even though you are not a signatory but you will have a right to go and access it secondly 
instruments of ratification acceptance approval or accession are to be deposited with the depository so here it is provided that under article 10 we appoint the secretary general of the united nation as a depository and here in article 11 clause 4 it states that instruments of ratification acceptance approval accession are to be deposited with the depository now ratification and signing to date the singapore mediation convention has been signed by 55 signatories including states as india usa and china out of the 55 signatories only six states have ratified the same now what is the distinction between signing and ratification so let's look at signing first signing merely signing does not make a convention binding but it indicates a support for the principles of the convention and the country's intention so i may sign that means broadly i am in con consensus with the convention but i also have an intention that somewhere down the line while i have considered everything while i have to put certain uh, things in place i might as a country end up ratifying the convention signing creates an obligation in the period between the signing and consent to be bound to refrain from acts that would defeat the object and purpose of the treaty so whilst i am not foisting the convention upon myself whilst i am accepting that i broadly agree with the mediation principles that are enunciated by the singapore convention i will also bind by signing that i will not do anything which will come in the way which will obstruct what the convention has set out to do unless i have a good reason for doing so whereas ratification once you ratify only six countries have ratified i think singapore convention can proudly boast that when it was thrown open for signing um, on 7th august 2019 it became the first convention which at first shot was signed by 46 countries present over there so what is ratification a convention becomes legally binding to a particular state when that state ratifies it ratification legally binds a state to implement the convention or optional protocol subject to valid reservations understandings and declaration so this is the so when you say i am legally bound when you say that under that uh, convention i shall be held liable when you say that from non justiciable i jump into the realm of justicing at that time it is called ratification signing merely mm, makes me a part of the large number of countries who accept the broad principles of mediation this was uh, about uh, the signature and the ratification as i was saying on 7th august 2019 it opened for signature in singapore under article 11 one of the convention and on the same date it was signed by 46 states including key economies such as the us and china on 25th february 2020s singapore and fiji were the first two countries that sat ratified the singapore convention followed by qatar on 12th march 2020 now why it is important we'll come to it a little later article 12 participation by regional economic integration now the, there are certain organizations which um, uh, may be called as a regional economic integra integration organization the best example we can give is of the european union for example suppose we have or we can give you know of um, a nam that is um, you know where all asian regions have come together so they are what you called as an economic integration organization so few countries of the world being geographically situated in a uh, you know a, a peculiar way they come together to be uh, economically bound so that at least trade and um, 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 uh, transactions can be smoothly ironed out between these countries so article 12 deals with um, uh, the regional now what does it say in brief participation by regional economic integration organization a regional economic integration organization that is constituted by sovereign states and has a competence over certain matters governed by this convention may similarly sign ratify accept approve accede to this convention so just like countries have been given the power called states 
in the UN um, uh, uh, realm. So similarly, uh, regional organizations, regional uh, economic organization have also been given the power to sign, ratify, accept, approve, accede to this convention. The regional economic integration organization shall in that case have the rights and obligations of a party uh, to the convention to the extent that the organization has competence over matters indirectly once you sign and once you ratify or um, accede to so you are uh, as a uh, economic integration organization will bind yourself with the um, um, uh, provisions of the convention non-unified legal systems if a party to the convention has two or more territorial units in which different systems of law are applicable in relation to this again i have uh, you know briefly summarized as then we can go to the if a party to the convention has two or more territorial units in which different systems of law are applicable so you take japan and you say take hong kong and you have two uh, or more territorial units where you have different systems of law uh, to, uh, it may at the time of signature, ratification, acceptance, approval or accession declare that this convention is to the extent to all territorial units or only to one or more of them and amend its declaration by submitting another declaration at a time. So if a party to the convention has two or more territorial units, so for example, um, uh, Hong Kong and Shenzhen of China or, um, uh, you know, um, um, uh, any two territorial units, you want only one territorial units to accept and you do not want the other territorial unit whilst it is, you know, considering the nuances of the convention, again, that, um, you know, uh, uh, possibility is made by Article 13 that uh, one territorial organization may accept it and another territorial organization may um, uh, do it at a later date. Now, wait, now, this is what is very important, which we actually thought about of ratification. What does it say? It says, uh, briefly, I've set it out here. This convention shall enter into force six months after the deposit of the third instrument. So as I was telling you all earlier, let me see if I find that slide. I think this one. Yes. So on 25th February 2020, Singapore and Fiji were the first two countries and followed by Qatar. So Qatar was the third country who signed it on 12th March 2020. Now let us see in the light of that, what does this article say? So this convention shall enter into force six months after the deposit of the third instrument of ratification. So Qatar on 12th uh, February, uh, sorry, 12, one second, uh, 12th March 2020, uh, Qatar was the third entity which signed and therefore if you want to say that on which date uh, the Singapore convention came into effect it was 12th March 2020 maybe akin to the opening of the pandemic worldwide so as mentioned this threshold has now been achieved such that the convention came into force on 12th September 2020 when a state ratifies accepts approves or accede to this convention after the deposit of the third instrument of ratification, acceptance, approval or accession, this convention shall enter into force in respect of the state six months after the date of deposit of its instrument. So the moment Qatar deposited its um, ratification with the depository in March, six months thereafter on 12th September 2020, it was a uh, Singapore convention was deemed to have come into force under article 14. At article 15 deals with uh, nuances as to when uh, circumstances, when it could enter, uh, there could be a need arise for amendment. Any party to the convention may propose an amendment to the present convention. How? Again, with the depository so you make um, you find that there is a particular clause and the countries or the uh, integrated organizations find that this particular clause is basically a hindrance and supports no one it needs a little bit of a change to be more helpful then it can make that uh, uh, request by way of submitting to the depository the secretary general shall thereupon communicate the proposed amendment to the parties to the convention for the purpose of considering and voting once it is put to vote in the event that within four months from the date of such communication at least one third of the parties to the convention favor 
such a conference the secretary general then will convene such a conference where the under the auspices of the united nation the conference the party shall make every effort to achieve consensus on each of this so there will be a a uh, a uh, a uh, a uh, a uh, uh, um, um, check on those arguments uh, they will uh, you know uh, um, check out whether those amendments serves the purpose for which it was and they will check the thrust of the um, um, pleadings and make a case whether that amendment should be ratified that amendment should be brought into play or not so it is basically done by a majority of vote of the parties at the can but most important present and voting at the conference so not merely you send you uh, when you are absent you cannot be uh, uh, you cannot be heard so present and voting is very important and adopted amendment then will become uh, accepted um, it uh, shall be submitted to the depository for ratification acceptance approval so countries which find that that amendment suits me it will once again go in the realm of ratification acceptance approval an adopted amendment shall enter into force again 6 months after the date of deposit of the third instrument of ratification acceptance when an amendment enters into force then again it shall be binding on those parties to the convention that have expressed consent to be bound by it when a party to the convention ratifies accepts approves an amendment following the deposit of the third acceptance approval of them shall enter into force in respect of that party so all the conditions that were there for the convention number 1 depositing the amendment with the depository 6 months within that that it will enter into force parties who ratify will have it binding upon them parties who make a reservation of that and deposit the reservation those reservations will apply within 6 months of time all the um conditions which were there for the convention will similarly apply to an amendment of those of the uh, to the amendment as well now we come to denunciation denunciations article 16 deals with denunciation it's the last clause of the singapore convention it says that a party to the convention may denounce this new convention by a formal notice in writing addressed to the a uh, depository and the denunciation shall take effect 12 months after the notification is reserved, uh, received by the depository uh sorry a party to the convention may denounce this convention by a formal notification denunciation may be limited to certain territorial units of for a non unified league now even 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 where you have a european union and the entire in, uh, commercial integrated union wants that it should have the convention it should uh, uh, sign the convention however certain countries within the union who have themselves not signed the convention or ratified the convention for reasons uh, you know special there they may be left out and the european union may sign the uh, leading to these countries to be denunciated from the the denunciation shall take effect 12 months after the notification is received by the depository where a longer period for denunciation to take effect is specified than longer period after notification is received by the depository so that is what we did in to conclude we can easily say that with the convention in force business is seeking enforcement of a mediated settlement agreement across borders can do so now applying directly to the courts of the countries that have signed and ratified the treaty instead of having to enforce the settlement agreement as a contract in accordance with each country's domestic process so instead of going to a country as uh, you know uh, filing a um, um, uh, uh, filing a litigation in their uh, domestic court as of a contract now you because of the convention thanks to the convention gratitude to the convention we have now uh, enforcing um, provisions where you can directly go and enforce the harmonized and simplified enforcement framework under the convention translates to savings in time legal cost which is especially important for businesses in times of uncertainty such as the current covid-19 pandemic thank you for the time and patience and now let's find answers to your questions 
thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity i would like to take some questions uh happily yeah thank you so much ma'am uh, for enlightening our audience by giving such a deep insight on importance of uh, united nation commission on uh, international trade law and singapore convention i'm sure uh, audience must be having a lot of questions and with this we are heading towards our question answer session i would request uh, mr uma yeah may i just say one thing uh, gratitude yes, to your lordship uh, i was informed that my lord will uh, leave uh, because he has certain uh, commitments so i i am really humbled by your pre oh, presence i was lord. benefited to a large extent by listening to you throughout i had some work in hand so i switched off my video but uh, i am on the table thank you so much for a very enlightening speech ma'am and was very exhaustive yes sir very exhaustive yes, learning it was gitanjali uh, ma'am thank you yes thank you ma'am and uh, now i would request uh, mr umang modi uh, assistant professor faculty of law to take up the question answer session over to you sir uh thank you uh, thank you parul ma'am and thank you uh, uh, honorable justice uh, vinit kothari sir and gitanjali ma'am for wonderful session we have received many queries uh, in our mail uh, from the student uh, for, uh, that chirag pandya has asked sir suppose uh, on uh, address to honorable justice sir that uh, suppose both parties arrive to some settlement during adr and decree pronounce but later if any of the party breaching their settlement or not complying with the settlement clause then there is there any remedy available to other party yes the answer is very simple it is a decree executable in the court so you can approach the court which pass the decree on the basis of the settlement for execution the party generally cannot renege on the settlement uh, without any very very grave reason of say fraud in consent etc uh otherwise it is executable decree so no going back from the settlement usually 99 uh, thank you sir for your answer uh, we have received another question from aksay uh, who saying that all reforms are driven by some incentive if advocates advocates representing clients are at a monetary disadvantage due to lesser hearing and lesser fees are they not likely to see mediation fail then be a successful yeah this is normal uh, impediment in the mediation as i said earlier also therefore the new law and probably new fees of due uh, fee schedule will come in place and we at the mediation centers usually encourage the parties uh, to pay their fees and the private mediation centers these days which are working uh, throughout the country are taking their usual professional fees even if the settlement happens or doesn't happen so soon i think we will develop a culture that uh, professional fees will not be a consideration for prolonging the litigation as it is infamously said about the lawyers the longer the trial the more the fees uh, so gradually this will go up. yeah hopefully yes. yeah yeah thank you sir that we have received another question from pile pande uh, addressed to ma'am and also you a uh, separate question has been asked to you and ma'am uh the ask question which is asked to you whether original record has to be sent to sent at the time of proceeding under matter under section 89 no no no, no. no original record is not usually sent only a brief report is sent by the court while referring the case to the mediation wherein the court can indicate what are the elements of settlement available according to the court original record is not sent because the uh, it, it is there is a chances of uh, uh, misuse or loss of record etc so unless if it's even if a copy is required the parties can produce from their copies original court court is not supposed to yes. uh, another question is whether a mediator can summon to testify any proceeding or to disclose what trans transpired during the mediation no it is absolutely confidential the mediator is not supposed to give any reasons for settlement or even if the settlement fails it is only up to him he can only facilitate and guide the settlement process the court cannot call upon the mediator to, to give any reasons for failure or reasons of success or background in which it succeeded or failed it is not supposed to be uh, another question is at what stage pending dispute can be referred for mediation at any that? stage right from zero to final any stage civil disputes can be referred i said earlier also even the supreme court in final appeal stage also refers sometimes looking to the nature of the dispute and again the elements of settlement if the opinion of the court says it is there Yes. Uh, thank so you. Even pre-litigation is now available, as I said. Uh, 
thank you honorable justice sir okay. now there are two questions from one, one uh, query which i saw in the chat box from one aditi was whether an encroachment of private property is a dispute for which suit is filed can be referred my answer is yes it can be referred because even if there is an encroachment the compensation is a way out for either settling the dispute for encroacher or even he can give consent also to vacate the private property subject to some compensation so there is always a chance of settlement even in these kind of disputes so it is also referable no dispute uh, sir there are also one or two question addressed to before that i would like to address okay. two questions to ma'am also yes sir. uh gitanjali ma'am there are two question for you one is can ancestral provide an authoritative interpretation of domestic law come again can ancestral provide an authoritative interpretation of domestic law authoritative uh, it is written like no. that yeah. no so uh, while each a uh, very good question very good question so while each of us is a state within the realm of the world and while each of us have our own domestic laws but you know for the uh, purpose of uh, having uniformity you know at least basic uniformity where parties to a transaction will be more encouraged to enter into bilateral and cross border um, transactions for that reasons if we know that you know at least the basic um, protection which i receive in my country will be also forthcoming in the world as a whole only for that purpose we have something called as a unicetral unicetral may uh, um, uh, say that this is a model law if each of the country depending on the level of development now take for instance i'll give you a simple example we're talking about a country say japan who is highly developed uh in every uh you know branch of law transactions etc we take a country a developing country like india or we take a under developing country say b now under developed country may have domestic laws which you know don't even um, uh, get into all this because they hardly have any transactions of that such nature to foist or to go into their domestic law and try to take change things will not help them may in fact injure them because those laws are customized for themselves so therefore um, the convention is merely a uh, looking at the basic uh protection to be given to parties to be used as guiding factors but they can never be a authority on our domestic law no in fact if you look at the denunciation and reservation provisions which are there in the convention it allows us that you know we may accept the convention as a whole we may ratify it as a whole but even then certain provisions we do not want to be a part of it is not suitable for us no questions asked you put it in writing like say government contracts we do not want our government to be a part of it we do not want government agencies to be a part of it we do not want a person who's been um, so authorized by the government to be bound by the convention so be it so you just have to put a written denunciation written reservation with the uh depository and it will be applicable you may withdraw it at a particular date when you find that today our government has reached a stage where it can participate in world contracts on a equal basis on that day you withdraw your uh, reservation yeah okay i thank hope i have answered the question <laughs> yeah yeah uh, thank you ma'am uh, then there is another question how closely linked are the unicetral model law on inter international international commercial arbitration and international indian arbitration regulations arbitration or mediation uh this is a question i think arbitration that how to, yes yes okay so the new york convention gave also gave a model law similarly like the um, model law which is given to us uh, by model law of 2018 now what is the meaning of a model law that's a very very again a very nice question i congratulate the students at their level of thinking so uh, in this case a model law is like i gave you a, a synonym or an uh, analogy i said that you know we have a com company's model by law we have a cooperative society's model by laws now cooperative society why i am taking a smaller example it will be help us to understand it a bigger picture so if you have a cooperative society model by laws now you have a small society where the building is seven structure um and uh, you know like total 64 flats 
in that society when uh, you know the residents themselves have whole days work uh, they hardly have time to give in to the uh, workings of the society so they merely go and adopt the model bylaws now once the society comes into place they look at the nuances and they realize that particular clauses of the model bylaws are in fact a hindrance they are too cumbersome they are too uh, you know uh, for big societies or they are not at all helping them so what they do is they uh, bring about an amendment to make it more suitable for themselves so you may have a model bylaw in place but you may uh, amend it to suit you and slowly you will change so much of it that you may soon have a bylaw of yourself in place same way internationally whether it is for arbitration whether it is for mediation we have a model law why is it necessary to have a model law because five member committee sitting in a cooperative society five people who are going to give unto themselves a company a register a company they wouldn't know what are the small things that we have to take care of while we are they only know in mind that we want to do a business cooperative society people only know that we have to fulfill the laws and file our return on time keep the account structure in fair now what is how do they know that these are the sections these are something which is compulsory and you need to take a note of the model bylaws help you so experts in the field sit and draft and help you have a model bylaw now you can make changes and say that we are bound by model bylaws but now with this certain reservations same way if i have answered your query arbitration was a new york convention which gave them a model law and arbitration and conciliation act which was then slowly slowly changed in so many ways uh, it was 1996 then we had several amendments the 2015 amendment and before that the uh, uh, other amendments why because we understood that these are the changes we need to inculcate to have a better law but how did we learn it we learned it from the time and tested provisions of the model laws okay thank you uh, sir uh, i think uh, i would like to take a last question uh, honorable justice sir for you that when mediation is completely voluntary process how can we convince people to opt for mediation and resolve all their disputes oh, amicably that is very good but that is where the education or counseling or persuasion by the court and the counsel is required it is voluntary but you have to guide them that it is in your own interest that you go for any a quick solution and going out of the lengthy court process that is the main objective of the mediation adr is like heart bypass you go for a bypass in your heart your blockages are cleared by the giving you a bypass in the court system you have blocked blocked uh, veins of the heart up to supreme court if you take a bypass to adr you will come out of uh, the clear heart very quickly and that is the whole theme which you have to educate the litigants who may not be knowing the utility of this beautiful adr system on their own that is where a important role of the lawyers and the referral judges both are and we always try to educate them persuade them that you have to you have to like market the idea you have to sell the idea it is the idea whose time has now come and therefore we all have to propagate it then only your uh, successful heart surgery or adr surgery will happen to explain in those terms so it is necessary voluntary but it is very important yes. yeah yeah thank you thank you sir uh, for uh, answering all the questions in ma'am for that uh, the question we suggest then will be judges answer the questions in judgments but it is a pleasure to answer here on this spot <laughs> pleasure sir pleasure but i am very happy with the maturity level of the students about 200 students have taken part both the sessions were very very i think uh, good for them and they have taken full keen interest in them that's what uh, i feel and thank you so much organizing team for and the university and the center for school excellence sayaji excellence school to organize all these such beautiful seminars and webinars thank you yeah. lot of it uh, shows that they have a, a great faculty which is you know backing them <laughs> no i have always been advocating this idea of senior advocates and judges going to universities and showing them the practical what is the judiciary all about so it's all it's good for them yes. so uh, thank you sir and ma'am uh, parul ma'am now you can take uh, session forward thank you so much sir and uh, it was indeed an insightful and enlightening session 
and uh, with this i would uh, request uh, mr hemang shah assistant professor faculty of law to propose vote of thanks over to you sir it gives me an immense pleasure to propose the heartiest gratitude to all those who have been a part of this online national webinar on mediation i hemang shah on behalf of faculty of law the maharaja sahaji rao university of baroda extend my heartly thanks to ms kavita balkrishnan madam the collaborator for this national webinar and the convener of this webinar for taking all pain in coordination with the speakers of this webinar series now it is my privilege to thank honorable uh, dr uh, justice vinit kumar kothari sir thank you sir for your valuable insight on the topic court room observations on mediation i'm sure this particular uh, session and the discussion uh, would uh, cherish by the students uh, forever thank you so much sir i extend my profound thanks to dr gitanjali prabhu shetty madam for accepting our invitation and sharing uh, your valuable thoughts on the topic impact of uh, unicetral and singapore convention i extend my sincere and profound gratitude to professor dr vijay srivastava the vice chancellor of our university and the patron of the webinar for his leadership and guidance in organizing this webinar i owe my deep gratitude to professor uma iyer madam osd faculty of law and the director of the webinar for her constant guidance and encouragement i am thankful to my colleagues uh, dr gansam solanki sir mr umang modi ms kavita bhagia mr rajkumar gupta for their cooperation in happening of this webinar thank you all i am also thankful to master of ceremony of this webinar ms parul singh and ms aishvi shah for their kind support i also extend my special thank to the reporters of this webinar ms sejal rishi and ms rirana for noting down the momentum of the webinar i am thankful to ms jagna jani for her technical support and admin staff for their cooperation for making this event successful and definitely last but not the least all the participants who have participated with zeal and putting various uh, question as well so that the session would be very much interactive thank you all